When it comes to what's happening in this country and around the world, the best podcast you can listen to is The Buck Sexton Show. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Who could have thought that when people told Democrats they had to treat Wisconsin like a battleground, they would take it quite so literally? iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to The Buck Saxon Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Candace Owens just knocked out Cardi B and poked the biggest hole yet in the stranglehold entertainment and media have on the minds of black voters in this country. I'm Rob Smith, and on the next episode of Rob Smith is Problematic, we are going to break down why the left uses idiots to reach black America and how Candace Owens just put them all on notice that they cannot do it anymore. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, this is Newt. Due to the virus, I'm recording from home. So you may notice a difference in audio quality. On this episode of Newt's World, President Trump has taken on China, challenged the deep state, secured our borders, and enacted stronger immigration policies. He's not only made America great again, he has set a new standard for all presidents, and he's likely set an agenda for the next 100 years. Lou Dobbs' new book, The Trump Century, How Our President Changed the Course of History Forever, opens a window into Trump's thinking on the economy, foreign policy, border security, and it will energize his allies when they realize the future they've shaped. I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Lou Dobbs. Lou is the New York Times bestselling author of six books and the host of the number one news program on business television, Lou Dobbs Tonight on the Fox Business Network. He's also the host of the nationally syndicated Lou Dobbs Financial Reports airing on the radio daily. Named TV's premier business news anchorman by the Wall Street Journal, Dobbs has numerous Emmys a Cable Ace Award, a Peabody Award, and many other distinguished honors. I'm delighted to have this chance to chat with a good friend of mine, somebody whose show I have been on many times, and it's always pretty remarkable. Lou Dobbs is the host of the number one news program on business television, Lou Dobbs Tonight, on the Fox Business Network is a new book coming out called The Trump Century, How Our President Changed the Course of History Forever. I'm delighted, Lou, to welcome you. You cover this country so well on your show and you have your finger on the pulse. What's your sense of where America is right now? We have never been in such confusing turmoil as now. We are now a nation that is, in my judgment, under assault by what was once the loyal opposition, and that is the Democratic Party. There is no equivocation on their part. They mean to overthrow this president right up until the election day, and perhaps maybe beyond that. They're vicious, and they are maniacal in their pursuit of power, and they mean to take it rested from this president one way or the other. And if they can't win at the polls, which in my opinion, they cannot, they mean and have threatened already to do so, take to the streets and to use as many tactics, Marxist tactics, to create great disruption and unrest in the country. I've never seen the like of it, not during the 60s, nor in any other period, which I've lived. It's breathtaking. You mentioned in your book that COVID-19 is the biggest threat ever to the re-election prospects of a president. I think without that, the Trump would be winning by a huge margin. So what do you think ultimately the effect of COVID-19 is going to be on the election? It's difficult to say without doubt, but I do believe that the president will emerge from this with truth at his side, because the reality is this president's decision making throughout this crisis, and he was, I think, correct to call or the national emergency. Remember, there were cat calls and mocking of the president for wanting to ban travel from China, from Europe, for calling it a national emergency. And now the very same people are criticizing him for delaying, doing all of the things that they oppose. 
But I believe that we're going to see a vaccine in such advanced stages. I think we're going to see schools open up. It's unimaginable to me that he has to persuade people to go back to school. He has to persuade people to open up their communities and their cities and towns because it's clear now the level of transmission, the the mortality rate, and it's not, thank God, as bad as we had feared. The reality is that closure represents as best we can determine far worse than staying shut down and shaking in fear of COVID-19 and not going about our lives as best we can. Are you a little surprised that Harris and Biden have been actively almost campaigning against the vaccine? You know, I am. You would expect in these moments of crisis that they would at least put on a good show of unity with the president. It is a public health issue. It is legitimately the worst crisis we've faced in decades, but they make no pretense. They are opposing vaccines. They are opposing opening the economy. They are opposing this president. They are even in opposition to the science that they so often accuse others of ignoring. It is a remarkable period. It is a straightforward lust for power, a venomous strategy that does not take into account either the well-being of their fellow citizens or the nation. It's just stunning what they have become and what they intend. And it is clear that they intend to wrest power from this president. Even with COVID and even with the other challenges, the real problem for the president is not Harris and Biden. The real problem for the president is the propaganda media, which has, mm-hmm. in my lifetime, just transformed itself. When you first went into the business, it was a totally different business than it has become. It was a totally different business. It was a totally different craft. The tenets of the craft, when I became a cub reporter, almost a half century ago, were clear. They were just standards to which you repaired every day in every way as a young reporter. I have reporters come in to look for a job, and within 15 minutes talking with them, they have no understanding of what an independent, objective press is required to do. They don't understand the language, they don't understand the values, and no one has even attempted to educate those values at any point, whether it's from academia or from a previous series of jobs in the business. This is a wholesale propaganda operation being run with corporate America and the behemoth media companies that own these news outlets, whether it is the Washington Post, the New York Times, NBC News, ABC, Disney, Comcast, AT&T, for crying out loud. It's just remarkable, the economic power that is concentrated in the hands of a few, and further, the concentration and awesome power politically that they have acquired by being the proprietors of fake news, which they are obviously sponsoring, supporting, and directing because they own it. I've been watching with fascination the conversation about Disney and its relationship with China. Communications companies have so much tied up in China that it's very expensive for them, very risky for them to tell the truth about the dictatorship. For the first time, I'm seeing it begin to become a public dialogue based around the Disney film Mulan and the fact that they actually had the audacity to film part of it in Western China where the concentration camps are. You were probably the first national news person to really understand the Chinese challenge. You must have some deep sense of satisfaction that this president has, in many ways, taken up your positions. Well, he was also taking these positions early on himself. I am so gratified that he is in the Oval Office because without him there, We would still be talking about two words we don't often hear, Newt. You don't hear people talking about free trade anymore, do you, in the public arena? That is dead and buried because this president has shown the destructive fiction that was pushed and perpetrated by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the biggest lobbying organization in the country, U.S. multinationals through the business roundtable, and Wall Street firms. 
they absolutely have had a reversal that they never imagined even possible. And that is that free trade is now seen for what it is. Trade deficits cut into GDP growth. You sacrifice growth. And we have sacrificed over the course of 50 years through trade deficits, somewhere between five and $10 trillion, depending on how you want to calculate it. But that's an extraordinary price for something called free trade. And in that, attach the insistence of Wall Street and corporate America to outsourcing jobs and the loss of 3 million manufacturing jobs, millions in service industries as well. It has been a horror over the course of the last 30 years for working men and women in this country and their families. Our middle class was savage. And many people don't realize the middle class wages stayed stagnant over the course of two full decades. It took this president to reverse it, and he had to take on the orthodoxy of academia, the orthodoxy of Wall Street, the business establishment, the political establishments of both parties, and that is why he is in the fight of his life politically. Because, as you know, the establishment never stands still when challenged, and they have been absolutely upended and disrupted by this president, and the ferocity of their response is obvious every day. I've been telling you about AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Have you joined yet? Now more than ever, mounting problems are facing America. Government growth, erosion of liberties, and the enormous financial burden our children and grandchildren will inherit if we do nothing. AMAC is the conservative alternative to other 50-plus groups. Since I first met them in 2007, AMAC has become a formidable defender of our values. Now, 2 million members strong and growing. The benefits of joining AMAC, you become part of an honest, active, and conservative force, one that counters the radical left's agenda. It's your chance to do well and good at once, keeping America strong. Beyond advocacy, AMAC gives you access to everyday money-saving benefits, like special rates and car insurance, cell phones, travel discounts, and more. You also receive AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter most. Stand with me and stand with AMAC even more vital now with the election ahead. Join today at amac.us forward slash newt. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S forward slash newt. amac.us forward slash newt. Candace Owens just knocked out Cardi B and poked the biggest hole yet in the stranglehold entertainment and media have on the minds of Black voters in this country. I'm Rob Smith, and on the next episode of Rob Smith is Problematic, we are going to break down why the left uses idiots to reach Black America and how Candace Owens just put them all on notice that they cannot do it anymore. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. I was startled when the Chamber of Commerce decided that it would endorse 23 Democrats, even though their first (laughs) vote's going to be for Nancy Pelosi. And I thought, this is a complete sellout of the interest of most American businesses. They're in that building down there in Washington, and they exist independent of the people they're supposed to be representing. They have been independent of all, but I'm going to say somewhere in the neighborhood of approximately the same population of the Business Roundtable membership, about 135 to 150 U.S. multinationals. They've held sway over the chamber. They have set the agenda for which it lobbies every day with great power and economic influence. To see them go with radical Democrats rather than stand with high-quality Republican candidates who are, unfortunately for them, aligned with the president, It tells you the power that he has right now at this moment in his presidency. He's been proved right on issue after issue after issue. And the chamber, Tom Donahue, the cardinal of corporate America's lobbying enterprises, he can't believe what has hit him because he has for so long been pulling so many strings so effectively on Capitol Hill. He can't get anyone to listen. It's got to be stunning to him. 
I was really struck with from the very beginning of the Trump campaign, and you do a good job in your book of reminding us that this was really Trump long before he was a candidate, that there's a mm-hmm. continuity in his analysis that's pretty amazing. And I told him on several occasions, he was going to be the most disruptive president since Andrew Jackson. And I said, look, when you disrupt these guys, they're going to fight back. I mean, you know, yeah. they're not going to roll over. <laughs> and they're going to be pretty pissed off at you. And I think it's surprised him how really deep and ferocious it's been. Those who know him, like you, understand that he really was surprised. You would think that as clever, as bright, and just instinctive when it comes to combat, that he would have understood that would happen. But he truly was surprised. He was hurt. His feelings were hurt that the reaction came as it did from some billionaire friends from the establishment. You could see it in so many ways that he was gut sick and often at the betrayal, as he saw it, of his establishment friends. They saw it the other way that he had betrayed them. He was a traitor to his class to be a populist president who actually kept his promises. My God, horrifying. The idea that he's keeping promises, those are supposed to be negotiable throughout, particularly with the moneyed interest and the donor class, braying at him to move one direction or the other constantly. He's a unique president. I think an historic president. I think he proved it in less than four years. He's accomplished more, and you're the historian. I'd love to hear your answer to this, because I've gone back through those presidents I thought were remarkable, and I can't find anyone save FDR and Abraham Lincoln who accomplished as much as this president in his first three and a half years in office. It is remarkable to see what he has done, for which, of course, he gets no credit from either the loyal opposition or the left-wing national media, or certainly the radical extremists of the left, in some cases, members of his own party, the so-called rhinos. I'd love to hear what you think of that. Well, and I think that's pretty close to right. I think you have Jefferson, who, after all, did buy half the country, which I always tell people that I'm prepared to be a Jeffersonian conservative if that means I get to buy half the United States. You know, and you had Andrew Jackson, who took on the entire establishment over the U.S. bank. But with those exceptions, neither of whom had the ferocity of hatred. I mean, I think Lincoln is the only president who had the level of intensity. I have a good friend who teaches at Princeton and Gettysburg, Helen Guelzo, who's an expert on the Civil War period. Right. And in December of 16, he wrote me and said, no president has had the level of vitriol that Trump is getting since the slave-owning newspapers of South Carolina attacked Lincoln. Mm. And I thought it was a very telling thing because, in a sense, Trump is to the anti-American left what Lincoln was to the slave owners. He's the beginning of the end of their world. And I think that they know that. And I think that's part of why you see the frenzy, because he was a surprise in 16. Now he's a fact. And I also think that you put your finger on something. The elites in this country were very pro-Chinese because they were making so much money. And they want to feel good about themselves. So they don't like being told that China is a dictatorship. They don't like being reminded about the million people in the concentration camps or the methodical destruction of the Tibetan Buddhist culture. And Trump comes along and he violates all these norms. And he's not only offending them psychologically, but he's threatening their pocketbooks to a huge scale. I mean, billions of dollars. And that's part of what I think motivates this kind of hostility. And they are to a remarkable degree in New York, Los Angeles, and Silicon Valley, and not in the rest of the country. So that's also why you get this strange geographic pattern where you can go through much of middle America And you see hundreds of Trump signs. And then you visit L.A. or New York or San Francisco, and you just see endless hostility, not necessarily pro-Biden, but deeply anti-Trump. Deeply and within the American left, it's a litmus test, and you're measured by 
the level of bile that you can generate about the president of the United States. And we see it in Manhattan, of course, in Los Angeles. Uh, you mentioned Silicon Valley, the so-called big tech chiefs. It's an interesting language we have. We refer to billionaires in Eastern European nations in particular as oligarchs. Billionaires here are fabulously wealthy and brilliant people who have only the nation's interest at heart. It's really a fiction that I think this president has, if not destroyed, he has significantly altered for the better for this country. We're starting to look with scales removed from our eyes at what we have wrought in terms of Silicon Valley and the enormous economic power they possess and electoral power as well. This is going to be a job for Donald Trump to do what he has promised he would do. And people forget he promised to break up big tech. And I think in the second term that we will see him take that on in a very energized way. We may actually see the Justice Department bring a case against Google before the election. I would cheer that. Yeah, I think that the degree to which they now are sliding into antitrust territory, I always tell people we have a deep visceral hostility to centralized power. And it was true with the Standard Oil, it was true with the railroads, it was true with IBM and with AT&T. And these guys have now slid into that because they're abusing their power. And therefore, they're not behaving as though they are holders of a public trust. They're using that position to radically change things. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Join me in the Freedom Hut, the one place where you know you'll get the straight story from a conservative perspective. Joe Biden, somebody who's been a machine politician, the Democrat Party from Delaware for longer than I've been alive. And nobody thought he was impressive. No one thought he had great leadership until about five minutes ago. They're trying to fool you. They're trying to pull off a con, a fraud against America. And Joe Biden is the con man in chief. The biggest names and the heaviest hitters in politics, trust me. So we've done a lot, Buck, and we have some great support. Your viewpoint is very important to me. Very, very important. That's how we got to know each other. Buck Sexton, formerly of the CIA. Buck, it's great to be back on the Buck Sexton Show. iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to the Buck Sexton Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. You've done so much business coverage over the years. Were you surprised by the speed with which the Trump economy replaced and accelerated past the Biden-Obama economy? Yes, that's a good way to put it. I was surprised by the speed with which it occurred, which speaks to the pent-up energy that had been suppressed through regulation, through the noxious anti-business, anti-capitalist leadership of the Obama-Biden presidencies, I didn't fully realize the degree to which they had been successful in that. The president, within a year of strong leadership, had awakened all of those animal spirits, and we started seeing great things happen. As soon as he put the two-for-one regulation into effect, that is, for every regulation created, two have to fall. My hope has been, and I went back and read Grant's book on the depression of 1920-21 to get a feel for this, because that was a depression that was so V-shaped that it never entered the collective memory. We went into it, it was very bad for about eight or nine months, then we came out of it, and unlike the Great Depression of the 30s, It didn't shape the 20s because it was over. And Trump has talked repeatedly about a steep V-shaped recovery. And it seems to me he may be getting it. What's your take of how the economy has responded? With 1920 coming after the pandemic of 1917-18, there's a terrific analog with what we're experiencing and with the China virus pandemic and the quick recovery. It has been an elastic response. 
the economy has moved because of some $3 trillion in fiscal stimulus and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 trillion in monetary stimulus by the Federal Reserve. We've seen remarkable strength in this economy, given what we went through in the second quarter. And it's sustaining. I'm amused to see Reuters and Bloomberg and a number of outlets, the New York Times included. Every number they look at, they find a way to say it's slower. It's worse than it was, when indeed you have to look with your lying eyes and see what truth is. We are seeing a remarkable recovery in the labor market, a remarkable recovery in the housing market. We're seeing sales of automobiles, for crying out loud, that are reaching pre-pandemic levels in some cases. This is truly a remarkable recovery. And if the president can persuade the Big Ten and others to play football and to open the society. We are going to be in very good shape, in my opinion, by the fourth quarter. I've been working on a paper that compares the Biden and the Trump worlds, pointing out that if you represent, say, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois, California, it's a great test bed for everything Biden says he believes in. And consistently, (laughs) whether it's violent crime or its deaths from COVID, or its unemployment numbers, the Biden world is a disaster. And if you actually just took numbers for the Trump world and excluded those, we would be roaring back right now. It's almost like the Democratic governors are doing everything they can to put the brakes on until after the election in the hopes that they won't help reelect Trump. I know you're right. The Democratic governors are now operating as a cabal. They're involved in college sports not being opened. They've shut it down. Their wall is breaking. The cabal is now being shown up by their peers. The SEC has shown the way, and the Big Ten has shown themselves not to be quite as big or tough as we thought they would be. They've been something of buttercups and daffodils, and now they've relented and they're coming back to be who we wanted them to be. The Pac-12 has yet to fall, of course. But we're seeing city after city now have to say, you know, we cannot keep saying we're going to stay close to the election. It's too obvious. And some of them are seeing their schools open up despite them because people are actually asserting their power in their school boards. And some Americans are actually realizing that they have greater control over their lives through proximity to government. And the most proximate government is their local government. And it's good to see people awaken to that political reality and to try to take charge. They keep trying to play games with national government. And of course, that gets all the headlines. But the fact is, we're seeing some positive things emerge from this. And I think we'll see certainly more than half the country opened and I think thriving by certainly going into the election. So it's another reason that I'm very hopeful about the outcome. So let me ask, if Trump does win re-election, What kind of 2021 Mm -hmm. do you expect economically? He's been prescient in his economic outlook. The left in particular, radical Dems, they hate the fact that he's been right. He was right to jawbone, to take on Jerome Powell, his Federal Reserve chairman, and kick his tail all over the front pages of news organizations across the country. And the clucking from the left was so loud and so hilarious because There is precedent, as you know, for presidents to do precisely that, not as colorfully, not as energetically as he did. But he was right. Jerome Powell, as is too often the case with Fed chairman, newly appointed, decided to show that he really knew what he was doing and raised rates four times going in to a period of absolutely tranquil inflation, nothing near the Fed's targets. And the president correctly kicked his tail for it and said enough and finally intimidated the board and the chairman into coming to their senses. But it took this president to do it. He was right. Go through the issues, rebuilding the military. He was right. China, he was right. Meanwhile, Wall Street is saying, no, you can't use tariffs. That'll destroy the markets or the economy will collapse. It was the inverse. The economy posting better than uh, 3% growth in a number of quarters. We're watching manufacturing return to this country. The trade balance issue is this president's. Guess what? 
the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, the central banks of every European nation should have been at the forefront agreeing with this president that we have to balance our international trade system to assure prosperity. And they didn't. Instead, because of the politics of the moment and the president's rather aggressive populism, they felt they would just stand back and watch what happened. And what happened is this president showed he truly is the leader of the free world. And he was right on balanced trade. He was right on China and its predatory trade policies. They're mercantilist as well as communist. And there's a combination for you historically. But there it is. And by the way, the greatest thieves in the history of the world. We built China. $600 billion a year in stolen intellectual property. Our deficits that ran up to a half trillion dollars a year. My gosh, what does it take? Well. To fix these things, it takes Donald Trump, and he proved he's the man, and he's fixed so much in such short order. And with the second term, I believe that 2021 will be a glorious repeat of what happened when the president was elected in 2016, in which he added over $30 trillion. And I say that advisedly. I truly believe he's responsible for what was the addition of $30 trillion to our equities markets from the time that he was elected to December of 2019. A remarkable, remarkable period. And I think we'll see history repeat itself with this president assured a second term. I just want to say I think you have done a real service with the Trump century. You are somebody who every single day is covering the news, staying close to what's happening in business and the economy. And you have been a very sound voice for years for the kind of breakout and new reform approaches that we finally are taking. I'm personally very grateful that you take the time to join us. And I'm going to recommend everybody, and it will be on our show page, The Trump Century, because I think that it's a very important book. And I am delighted that you would take the time to be with us. It's been a highly enjoyable time, and I always enjoy talking with you. And I thank you for it. I wish all the best. And now I'll answer your questions. Bruce M. from Texas asks, Hello, Newt. I was wondering how you as a historian, politician, and patriot feel about how our Supreme Court has so blatantly become a political weapon rather than the upholder of the Constitution. The fierceness with which both parties fight for nominations has made it obvious that it is no longer used as it was intended and is rather now a side branch of the legislature. Well, Bruce, I think if you go back through American history, you'll find that starting with Jefferson's great hostility to the courts around 1800, that there's a long tradition of the courts being controversial. Lincoln, for example, deeply disagreed with the court on the Dred Scott decision, which said that slavery could exist in every state. So I think Franklin Roosevelt was so frustrated with the courts that he actually tried to pack them and was defeated by his own party. So I think the courts have always been inherently part of how America talks to itself and how it gradually changes things. Thank you to my guest, Lou Dobbs. You can read an excerpt of his new book, The Trump Century, How Our President Changed the Course of History Forever, on our show page at newtsworld.com. Newt's World is produced by Gingrich 360 and iHeartMedia. Our executive producer is Debbie Myers, and our producer is Garnsey Slump. The artwork for the show was created by Steve Penley. Special thanks to the team at Gingrich 360. Please email me with your questions at gingrich360.com slash questions. I'll answer a selection of questions in future episodes. If you've been enjoying Newt's World, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and both rate us with five stars and give us a review so others can learn what it's all about. When the next episode of Newt's World, Heritage Foundation President Kay James joins me for an engaging discussion on why the 2020 election matters and what Heritage is doing to promote America's core values, protect our election integrity, encourage school choice, and shape immigration reform. I'm Newt Gingrich. This is Newt's World.
I've been telling you about AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Have you joined yet? AMAC stands against the problems facing America, government growth, erosion of liberties, and the enormous financial burden future generations will inherit if we do nothing. AMAC is the conservative alternative to other 50 plus groups. Stand with me. Join today at amac.us forward slash newt. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S forward slash newt. When it comes to what's happening in this country and around the world, the best podcast you can listen to is The Buck Sexton Show. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Who could have thought that when people told Democrats they had to treat Wisconsin like a battleground, they would take it quite so literally? iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to The Buck Saxon Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.